Okay, here we are. I'm Jeffrey Fox. And we're on the fourth of these uh, sub lectures in the Hadoop and MapReduce section of the class, or cloud computing class. So let's get going. And uh, we're going to go through things like MapReduce, um, Yarn, and the other critical shuffle and so on, which are the components of Hadoop. Um, if you look at Hadoop, it has several core components, some sort of general common software. This is a software engineering statement. It has the very important HDFS, because I said that's likely to be the part of Hadoop that survives changes. It has the resource manager, Yarn, which is split off in Hadoop 2. Hadoop 1 integrated Yarn and MapReduce together, but now they've correctly separated it so that you can actually build Hadoop with Mesos or Kubernetes and you don't, you're not forced to use Yarn. And then MapReduce actually has the programming model. Yarn schedules the task, HDFS describes the back end this, uh, this system, and the MapReduce component uh, does the programming for you. Okay, so here's this uh, architecture of HDFS, which you pointed out was a critical component of Hadoop. We have uh, the user, there is a name node, which actually Tracks the um, um, metadata, which describes where things are. <coughs> and then we have data nodes, which actually store the data, which is um, either replicated or has some sort of redundancy uh, parity check built in. And the, the name node in um, the latest version of Hadoop is replicated for fault tolerance. So, and uh, we've already, I believe, described how uh, the key idea in Hadoop is to um, take every piece of data, take your data set, chop it up into blocks, which originally were very large blocks, 128 megabytes, but now are much smaller. Uh, so that they can deal with small files. If you have giant blocks, then you're not going to be able to deal with small files very effectively. Anyway, each block is uh, replicated uh, three times in the standard Hadoop. This slide puts into um, words what I already said. HDFS divides files into blocks. The blocks have a have a size which is defaulted to 128 megabytes, but you can configure to smaller numbers or, lo or even larger numbers, which are which basically fit the type of data you have. If the data is lots of small units, then this is too big. Uh, typically, you store three um, three copies of everything. That's the replication factor. We'll learn later that new versions of Hadoop use other. Um, sophisticated encoding mechanisms to get uh, equivalent fault tolerance methods which use less space. This is, has a disadvantage, of, it's, very, it's very simple, but has the disadvantage that you have um, um, use three times as much space. If you also view this um, multiple copies as a way of getting um, better performance, because you take hotspots and replicate them, then the, the, this method of fault tolerance is not so bad. But Typically, not all the data is hot, and so using this method uh, uniformly is inefficient. Um, there's some important issue about how you store it. You don't want to store it all in the same rack, because then if the rack goes down, all copies are lost. You don't actually want to store it all in the same um, region of the country, because again, if power goes out, then everything is lost. There's also something called the high availability feature that is um, not to do with the replication of the data nodes, but replication of the name node, the server that keeps track of everything. Um, so this describes the three sort of basic demons associated with HDFS. There is a name node which is provided on a cluster basis, um, which is the process which maintains the file system and the metadata for all the files and directories. and um, Everything is stored in memory, and um, if it's just one node, or it could be a bottleneck. Um, as we see at the bottom, there's also a secondary name node, also per cluster, which is the backup to the name node. That's in the later versions of Hadoop. And we'll see a picture later on of the rather 
messy way that uh, the name node and the secondary name node maintain consistency. There are also on every node, which is uh, stores data, a, a data node daemon, which is uh, in charge of actually storing and retrieving data from disk and finding out where to put new data and things. It also does heartbeats to tell the world it's alive, or if the heartbeat doesn't exist, that it's not alive. Here is the uh, picture of the uh, high availability architecture, which is the one which has the uh, uh, name node, uh, both active, which is the single one, and the standby, which is the replacement. Those talk to the data nodes, which are DN. And then we have some um, zookeepers, which are this um, concurrency consistency methodology, which I mentioned already. And uh, it, it actually, Zookeeper oversees these journal nodes, which allow you to share state between the, um, um, between the active and the standby name node. Uh, when you, whenever you have this, the reason why you have Zookeeper and things, whenever you have this type of uh, uh, duplication, it's very hard to make certain that the duplicates are the same, because they can then never be exactly the same at any one time. If you update one, you can't guarantee the other is updated at the same time, and so on. So you need some cleverness to make certain you both update, but only commit the update until you know the other one is updated. And uh, there's some controller also, which is keeping track of all this thing, and it also has its own backup. Now here's another slight subtlety that if you have multiple clusters, which could even be distributed. You can federate those clusters so that maybe um, each of those, each of these set of nodes uh, only does one part of the disk system. Because remember, you might have slash user one, slash user two, and slash user three. You can put those on different um, uh, HDFS uh, um, units or different, and uh, have each each has their own name node associated with them. Um, so they all, the data nodes are in common, but the multiple name nodes are independent and differentiated by your assignment of the different parts of the disk system to the different parts of the federation. Thank you. Now we go on to more details. All right, so here is the overall architecture. We have Yarn, the resource manager. We have this marvelous name node, which is looking after the data and controlling the backend file system. We have a uh, application master, which is running the actual application. Every node has a node manager. And then we have the, what this uses the word slave. I prefer the term marker. This is a mark master. Worker framework, not a dictator slave framework. And then we have every node has its own manager, and um, they're done in parallel with these capabilities up here. This is an Hadoop 2 and 3. This slide has got the same structure as the previous one, but gives more detail. We see the application manager as part of the resource manager and the scheduler as part of the resource manager. We have each data node is done now in a modern fashion with containers, uh, which in uh, Doop 3 are actually Docker. And so we have a nice, good, a nice model which is compatible with the overall philosophy that you build everything around containers and uh, use technology such as Docker to manage those containers. And then the containers, or each node has its own set of containers. So this slide describes how Yarn, the resource manager, fits with the rest of Hadoop. The clients, or several clients, can access a given resource manager. Every node has a node manager. And then we have the application master, which is specific to the application. And it manages containers on multiple nodes. And um, we have two, we have a pink job with an application master here, and a purple job with an application master here. 
and uh, they all have containers on which are either on the same node or on different nodes. And so the resource manager manages this complexity. And they all send uh, messages back and forth to keep track of what's going on. So this sort of says what we already showed in the pictures. There's a scheduler and an application manager in the resource manager with a scheduler. Notice Linux, or let's suppose you're running Linux on, the, on these machines. Linux actually does the hard work. It decides which tasks to run when, and if it, whether a task is waiting for disk or not. What the scheduler does is just assign task to cause. And then ask Linux to do its, do its thing. And those schedulers, there's a huge amount of work, far too much work on schedulers. Because um, the reason people write scheduler works is it's, much, it's about the only part of the system you can touch as a user. It's not particularly the most important, in my opinion. I think what Linux does is the most important. How you decide when to stop a task and restart it and things like that. Um, so there's a reservation system, as in classic scheduling system. Say so the different scheduling strategies, and trying to be fair to jobs, or trying to maximize the largest job, and things like that. And let's say you can plug and play with those, uh, but most people just leave them as they are. Most, I mean, I have written papers in this area, and um, we have an application manager which accepts the job submissions and sets up the containers, and it also restarts failed containers.